I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind away? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name just wanted to welcome everybody here and say good morning. We're glad to join, that you're joining us. If you're a visitor this morning, we've got some, some gifts out there at the, at the Welcome Center for you. Um, this next song that we're going to do, I want to talk about it for a minute. Um, it's Waymaker. I'm sure you all have heard it, probably done it here before I got here. Um, I want to read a, a verse. It's Isaiah 43, 19. And it says, look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? It says, indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And so at, at times like this, and, and you look at the landscape of our country right now and kind of everything that's going on and with, with the pandemic and the election and, and the riots and all this craziness, you know, it, it's nice to be able to look back and see the promises that God gives us, that he's going to make a way, that no matter what storm we go through, that God's gonna make a way. And that's one thing that we looked at on Wednesday nights with our students last week is we just sat and we went through the Bible and we looked at all these promises that God gives us, all these things that he says in scripture. 
And this is one of them, that he's our way maker, that he's, he's always gonna lead us on the path to righteousness. And so as we get into this song, just kind of, as you sing, think about what it is that you're saying as we worship him this morning. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship.
Aren't you glad that he's a windmaker? Let's give him a hand of praise this morning. Hey, we're going to do a song here real quick that I know everybody knows. So if you would just sing loud and let's be proud in this moment to sing it. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what We thank you so much for allowing us to come into this place, Father, just to be able to come and to worship you, Father, with no restrictions, Lord, and just to, to give you all that we have, God. I pray that as Eric comes, Lord, that, that we would listen with an open heart, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody in pretty decent shape today? Had your breakfast, Wheaties, oatmeal, grits, whatever it is you do for breakfast. Anyway, I've never quite figured out how to do breakfast. But anyway, man, you know, some mornings you just, you plan, you plan, and they don't exactly go how you thought. And so anyway, I get here this morning, and everything on the computer, it's ready to go. In about 20 minutes till, it says, would you like to update? Have you ever had that happen on your computer? Now, I've felt helpless in my life, but I, I don't know that I've ever felt quite or any more helpless than when that came up and it gave me two options update now or wait one hour now if I waited one hour it would have been updating right about right now so I thought how does this thing rule my life I don't have any choices all the effort all the planning is is just waste now I can go back old school but I've kind of grown kind of crippled by this thing at this point so anyway, well, I didn't talk to Chris, probably should have. I pushed update now. And then it told me it was going to be a while. 1%. Not yet. <laughs> 2%. And I, I have 20 minutes, or actually about 15 minutes at this point. So anyway, um, I thought it was all going to be wasted and lost. And then right when he started singing, it finished. And so we can use that. But I don't know what's about to happen. Everybody understand that? So this is just kind of a, a benefit this morning. I don't know if it's going to work because it's definitely not centered. But we'll figure it out when we get there. Good luck. You know, sometimes God puts us in a place for an update. And uh, we're sure not ready for it. It leaves us feeling very helpless, very frustrated. And our options that we see, neither one of them is very desirable. 
But at the end of the day, he is in control, and as Ricky shared, uh, he is doing a new thing. He didn't ask me whether I'd like it or not. But God chooses to do new things, and aren't you glad he does? Even though they may seem they're not worth having, they're not welcome, they're not comfortable, they're not pretty from our perspective. But from an eternal perspective, they are beautiful, and they are wondrous. And they bring glory to and honor, and will bring glory and honor to the name, the only name that deserves it. And so as we see ourselves today in this space of frustration, despair, and anxiety, may I just remind you the same God that's spoken into existence has got this crazy thing in his hand. And friend, we're going to wake up after an election, Christians, just like we were the day before. I just encourage you, please stay positive, encourage, let your words be words of hope, words of comfort. While some of you, some of us, may be fighting mad about one thing or another, may we fight for the gospel as much as we fight for anything else. Otherwise, friend, we pretend that we're in some kind of control of something, and you're not. All right, now I'm going to ask you to join me again in Revelations chapter 2. It has been estimated by some listening I may finish the Revelation by sometime mid-next year. Let me just assure you that's probably a little presumptuous. Um, man, the, the more I, I'm kind of nervous to get into the, some of the symbolism that comes because I don't know how long um, the depth, folks, and, and I've always encouraged you guys, instead of reading the words on the page, let the words become a part of your life, what you see, what you smell, what you taste. Let, they're alive, it says. They're not just recorded to exist on these pages but to exist and not just in your understanding but in your application but also even more than that your worldview how you see how you understand how you respond how you perceive how you communicate you know your confidence your vision your your hope your despair at times should certainly um, one of my favorite songs right now is Father's House. I don't know if you've heard that, but I'd encourage you to, to go on whatever Amazon or whatever you use to listen to Pandora, whatever it is you use, um, and, and look up that Father's House song by Corey Asbury. Uh, phenomenal. Just absolutely phenomenal. I, I rocked out to it three or four times driving in. Um, I love my family in the car, but when I'm by myself, I just like to turn up that music so loud that no other thought can exist other than worship and praise. And I just encourage you again, have a time, whether it's just you and the Lord, where you can drown out every distraction. And so if you ever hear me going through town, and it seems a little inappropriate for the pastor to be listening to his music that loud, just know my music's about Jesus when it's that loud. When I'm listening to gangster rap or country, I turn it down a little bit, okay? All right, so here we are in Revelations chapter 2. I'm just kidding. I don't listen to this. Revelations chapter 2, and like I said, it's not going to work, so we're just going to go ahead and move on to Revelation chapter 2. If you're there in your Bible, smartphone, iPad, whatever it is, say amen. amen. All right, and if you would stand out of recognition for God's inspired, inerrant, which means without any error in any shape, form, or fashion, we hold it to be true. We hold it to be the principles of practice, doctrine, theology. We hold it to be the standard of our application. Here's the other deal, when we get in, and we've been having a lot of conversations with folks about hermeneutics, which is the process whereby you study, you approach God's Word, and please remember, your feelings do not interpret the truth. The truth interprets your feelings, okay? So I don't approach God's Word on how I'm feeling today, I approach God's Word on what's God's Word say. What is it always said? Not what does it just say today. What is it always said? What is that truth? And then what is the application of that truth? So let us begin in verse 8. Actually, 12. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamon. Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. And oh, there's a beauty in that that we'll see in just a second. He says, I know where you live. 
I know logistically, I know geographically, I know emotionally, I know spiritually. I know where you live, and I know where Satan's throne is. Yet, you're holding on to, to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there in your church holding to the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. You have these people in your church whether you know it or not and I'm going to have to deal with them. In the same way, you also have those who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Remember, Clement of Alexander said in the early days A.D. that the Nicolaitans were like wild goats, he said. That they just wandered, devouring whatever they wanted to, seeking whatever self-pleasure they had upon their mind. I have a little funny story before we go any farther. I thought one time, and I know you're staying, it's good for you folks, blood circulation. My watch even reminds me to stand, so you can mark that off your list for today. That I thought when we, we moved finally out in the country, and our kids were small. Matter of fact, Aiden was there, Ashton was coming along, and they got up a year or two. And, and I decided to get them a baby goat. Now, they ain't nothing cuter than a baby pygmy goat. I'm just saying, they're like yay big, yay big around. And I thought the kids could ride it around the yard and grab it by its horns, and we would have redneck fun all day. So I brought the goat home, and the only thing about my sweet wife, Jeanette, she will never really disagree with me. She just advises me otherwise, right, ladies? So she knows if you tell me no, I'll pout, and then I'll go get it and I'll hide it from you. But I'll still have that baby goat, because when I get in my mind a baby goat's a good idea, a baby goat is a, no, no, it's the best idea. And so I went and got the baby goat, and I built a little 10 by 10 porch or fence right off of our porch so I could sit on my back porch and feed it stuff because I, I just thought that was fun, and it would, man, and you know, we were buddies. Well, when you weren't feeding it, it was the most horrendous sound I have ever heard in my life. See, I took the baby off the nanny at Mr. Reagan's house in Lavaca. I loaded it up. It was making a little noise going home. But that night, and it was by our bedroom window. <laughs> You're, it's like someone was harming it. And so anyway, three or four days of sleeplessness, and Jeanette looks at me like we have a problem. And I knew I had a problem. And I thought about dealing with a baby goat and what I would do, and I would give it, no, no, no. So what I did was I just drove by real slow one day at Mr. Reagan's house. Jumped out, grabbed the goat, threw it back over his fence, and went back home. One thing I figured out while we were having a goat, that stupid thing would eat anything. He had no discipline. I couldn't keep it in the pen. He'd crawl out anything. He did not know what was best for him. He'd get out, and he'd just head off in the neighborhood. For Clement to say the Nicolaitans were like wild goats. Y'all seen those on the bridge the other day at the overpass in 49, didn't you? Do you know what had to happen to them? Somebody had to shoot them, an officer. Because they were such a distraction to all the traffic going by. They were stupid enough to get out there and risk their own lives. They were also stupid enough to do something that would cost their life. But to, for, for Clement to say again, like wild goats, that is certainly in no way a compliment. He says, so Repent. Realize, remember where you've been. Go a different way and never go back there again. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly. Notice that. I'm about tired of this. You repent or I'm coming and I'm not just going to just pilfer in there. I'm not just going to frolic in there. I'm coming and I'm coming quickly. And fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Important. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, to the people. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is ascribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. In the name of the sovereign one, 
Lord, we'd ask that today our time together would honor, would glorify you. That having been together, having heard your word, we'd never be the same. Lord, I pray that again this morning we would be honest and transparent before your throne. As your eyes of fire, your feet of bronze, the sharp two-edged sword, the truth. It already knows us and has already found us. Like a wild goat, ignorant and arrogant, we can run to our own demise or surrender to the truth. And it is the name, that name, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That name deserves all glory, all honor, and all praise. That name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated, friend. Now, a couple quick facts about Pergamos before we go any farther, just to give you a little context. And context is very important in your hermeneutic. What is going on in this day and time, in this culture, for the Lord to write to this church in Pergamos and say the things he said? And then how do we take that truth and how it actually applies there and apply the same truths to where we are today? Pergamos means citadel, city on a hill. Um, it is also the word where we get parchment. It was a skin uh, that, that was used to write on, to document, scrolls you might think. Uh, Pergamos was built on a thousand foot hill and around, surrounded by 20 miles of fertile plain, 20 miles east of the Aegean Sea. Aegean Sea, Pergamos. All right, so there's where we are geographically. Uh, we talked a little bit over the last couple weeks about the, the cult of Caesar they were actually, the, they've been a Roman province of Asia Minor for 250 years, and they were the capital of Asia Minor. Uh, now, religiously, very interesting. So, when it starts out here and it says, I know where you live, okay? This is why this is important. The religious center it w was there in Pergamos. It was also the focus or the emphasis where the, the, the center for the cults, and here, here's what they had going on, a temple to Athena, which is the goddess of war, a temple to Asclepius, which is the god of medicine, whose symbol is the snake, the same one we use today, Dionysius, the god of wine and ecstasy, also drunkenness. And then, of course, don't leave out Zeus, the god of sky, lightning, and thunder. And then this was the capital for the cult of Caesar. So when we think about Pergamos, this church was absolutely inundated with opposition. Pretty much, any, again, any god you can think of had a temple at that time. And not just a group meeting in a house, an actual church. Now, as, as worked up as we get, when someone has, has put in a, a temple to something we don't agree with in Fort Smith or the River Valley, folks, this place was fighting every opposition imaginable for this time and place. So now, let's get to the passage. He says, write to the angel in Pergamos, write to the leader. Thus says the one who has a sharp, double, two-edged sword, the, dark, the sharp, double-edged sword. So what is the significance of this? Well, Scripture tells us that his word is like a two-edged sword. And it cuts and it slices and it divides. So whatever is truth and whatever is error, those things cannot mix because there is a sharp two-edged sword dividing them. What do you think is the sharp two-edged sword that divides truth from error, righteousness from evil? scripture so he's saying starting off in the beginning he says i know where you live and the one who holds the one who wields that sharp double-edged sword that one who separates truth from error fact from fiction truth from opinion concrete eternal truth from your finite egocentric humanistic feelings is that right there so he says, I'm, and I'm not just wielding anyone, I'm wielding the one. And so when I come to you, and when it's time to, 
to cut some mess out of your life when it's time for me to come and judge what is true there, what is evil and righteousness, what is selfishness and righteousness. Do you know the difference there? We often think evil and righteousness, Satanistic in, in, for, for God, righteous, but there's also selfish and righteous. And that, that sword cuts, it divides, it reveals it's that thing that comes through. You know, as a kid, still, I can't stand onions. I don't want to smell them. I don't want to crunch them. Nothing about them appeals to me. And so I pick through. And I must, it is in me, every fiber of my being, to get every single onion. Pet peeve of mine when I was a kid, when I go to Walmart, I mean, McDonald's drive through and I'd get a double cheeseburger for one dollar. I could eat five. Five dollars. And there would be one. And when I opened it, I could smell it. Now, they, yeah, they cut them up about this big, but I could smell it. And if it ever hit my mouth, out the window. Couldn't handle it. God's Word cannot handle the existence of evil. It says, flee the very presence of evil. Don't, don't flee you doing it. Flee the fact that it's there. Hate it so much you can't even stand to breathe the same air that it consumes. So he says, when I come with that sharp double-edged sword, listen, everything that we're about to look at revolves around this right here. That sharp double-edged sword you are not ignorant to. I gave it to you. So when I come... And I, I start cutting things out of your life. You have no reason to, to feel hurt or offended or caught off guard. Because, child, church, Pergamos, I gave it to you. Now, why is, that, why is that important right now? Because we've got cults in the church. The biggest cult that has ever harmed the church is a cult of humanism. Now you listen, it scarred, destroyed humanity from the beginning. Adam and Eve did the one thing, that, the, one, the only one thing they were told not to do. And why did they do it? To become like God. Do you not attempt the same thing every time you abandon His commands for what you think is the right thing for you in life? Yes, it's exactly what you do. You say, I know I'm not supposed to do this thing, but God, I think I know what's better, and I choose to eat because I want to know for myself. I can't take the advice of generation after generation. I can't just heed the commands of your word. I got this. So when he says, I come with a sharp, double-edged sword, this is the truth whereby you will be judged. Here's the beauty. He is not going to catch you by surprise with anything. There is one thing I love. I love consistency in my life. You know, as that computer was talking about, I was just thinking about, you know, there's something in everything God wants us to see, I believe. If He's sovereign and He is, then all things, all things and I kind of feeling sorry for myself why well, I put all that in there and now it may not work but you know none of us like any updates in our lives do we it comes at the worst time but God puts us in places to stretch us to make us more efficient for his glory and friend at the end of the day I ain't got no choice but one thing I've figured out, he is absolutely consistent with me. He expects his commands are the same day to day to day to day to day. Now, and we still have trouble. Now, all this is about to line up. We still have trouble doing what he's asked us to do when he asks the same thing every day. Same thing. Well, let's keep going. Get ready. He says, thus 
says the one who has a sharp double-edged sword. I will cut when I need to cut. I will divide when I need to divide. I am watching your life. I'm watching the church, and I want you to know whenever it's necessary, I will. I'm just warning you, you have the standard. Here we go. He says, I know where you live, church. I know because, let's just look at it. We're going to see momentarily, we've discussed the cults that are around them. So if ever, let's just, let's, just, let's just justify this thing like people do, like we all do. We've got a church in the middle of a bunch of cults, a bunch of heathens, a bunch of Satanists. And if something is not worshiping the Lord, if it's worshiping any created, any imagined article, piece, item, you understand that's Satanism, right? It's created by human hands. It's not a religion, it's, it's satanic. So they're right there, right smack dab in the middle of them. And a church might be tempted, a body might be tempted. Let's just think for a second. We got a hundred folks coming to First Pergamum. Could be a free, I don't know what church is, it really doesn't matter. I just, we always call it First Baptist something, something and I don't know if that's going to be anywhere. And let's just say we're imagining reaching them. Because there's a thousand of them and a hundred of us. So if we can get 10 or 15 coming now, let's just understand that they may come and they may be a little bit different. And we're going to love them, right? You better. I was thinking about this this morning when I was driving and listening to the Father's house. I was just picturing that this is his, right? And we, take, we tend to take so much ownership over this thing. We get so passionate about our opinions in relationship to something that's not even ours, okay? I mean, it, it just amazes me that the hills on which churches divide when you don't even own it. It's not yours. But anyway, let, let's keep going. And I was just thinking, you know, when someone comes to my house, you know what just blesses my heart? And you listen, making them feel comfortable, making them feel welcome. Friend, if you come to my house and you come in, I'm going to get you something to drink, water. I'm going to get you something to eat, right? I'm going to cook. I'm going to cook my best meal. And I'll tell you what it is. It's Catalina chicken. You marinate them strips of cattle. There's some marinating right now in the fridge. I'm going to grill it this afternoon. You throw it on that grill and them tender little juicy strips. You get a little black on it. You flip it over. Get a little black on that side. Bring it in, put it on a bed of rice, a little bit of soy sauce, a little bit of yum-yum. Anybody know what yum-yum sauce is? I do. I buy it by the gallons, three or four at a time. If you ever see my cart, I have a problem. And friend, there's just nothing. So if you ever come over, you're going to eat Catalina chicken, you're going to eat grilled tuna, or smoked ribs. Because that's just, that's my best. Now, I don't have a lot of best, but that's my best. And my best you're going to get when you come to my house. Now, this is the Father's house, right? Okay. And so when anyone's a guest in his house, you had better be assured that the Holy Spirit from eternity past, I just usually get ready for company a couple hours in advance. The Holy Spirit has prepared all the events in life to bring a soul, a human being. Now, don't you lose me right now, and I don't want to lose you. For this day and time, the, the Holy Spirit is drawn to the Father's house, and He comes in, and what do we do? The Holy Spirit's mission is to prepare that soul for the invitation, for the effectual calling of the Holy Spirit, and He's preparing that heart. And then we come in, and we change how welcome someone is in the Father's house. Now think about it, chew on it. If I invite somebody that I want to help or that I care about to my house, now listen, and you happen to stop by, and while you're there in my house, in my company, the people that come over for me to love on, for me to spend time with, you acted a fool in my house to my company, 
You see it yet? Let's keep going. I know where you live, so I know you're right there. You're right there in the epicenter of paganism. And you're a church. Now, see, that, that, that is a compliment. I know how hard, he says, I know how hard it is to be a conservative, Bible-believing, God-fearing church that believes in the inerrancy and the infallibility of God's Word, who believes that the Holy Spirit, that there's only one name under heaven among men by which we must be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. I know how hard that is. Let's keep going. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Wow. I know you live in the epicenter of satanic activity for your day and time. I know there's no church anywhere else fighting the adversity and the hardship and just the overwhelming presence of spiritual warfare that you're fighting. And friend, if you do not believe or understand spiritual warfare, please come talk to me, study. I'll give you resources, but it is as real as the air you breathe and the life that you live. Or Satan's throne is, yet, yet, you are holding on to my name. Oh, church, my bride, I know where you live, and I want to tell you, you're still fighting the fight. You're still, there's still a sign out in front of your church that says the church of Jesus Christ. Not Latter-day Saints, you hear that? My sign says the church of Jesus Christ, all right? And I, that doesn't mean we're the only one, all right? Anyone who professes the name of Jesus Christ is a child of the Almighty King. You agree with that? Say amen. Now keep going. Yeah, you're holding on to my name and did not die, deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you, where Satan lives. The word martyr means witness. After Antipas' death, it becomes synonymous with a Christian who would die for their faith, or anyone it was intended for Christianity, used for Christianity for the most part. But its definition came from this time period. Antipas was placed in a burning bronze metal bull and burned to death, boiled, cooked, roasted, inside of it alive. Um, the pain, um, if you've never read any of, Fox's Book of Martyrs, any story of the martyrs, friend, you should. Um, there was one year I just spent a, a, a day reading the story of a martyr every day. And it is humbling, and it is exhausting, to be frank. And the exhaustion is an awareness of how little I care. Um, Please read it. You can Google it every day. Do it once a week. Um, anyway, let's go back. But I have a few things. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Church. There used to be a couple guys who would encourage, promote Moabite women to marry the Israelite men. They would seduce, and once here, kind of, you might compare that to Samson and Delilah. Once married, they would bring in practices to harm, to pay back the Israelites, to get revenge. And in that practice, you've brought in eating meat sacrificed to idols. Now, again, this is a reference to an Old Testament situation. Again, if I go to someone's house today and um, they offer me meat and they're of a different world religion and they pray to their God, friend, that's not going to bother me whatsoever, okay? That God ain't real, all right? They're wasting their breath. But the one thing I'm not going to do is throw that food at them, get up, and leave their home, all right? Um, I'm going to stay right there. I'm going to be a witness God called me to be. Uh, I will love them. I will be respectful. 
Um, when I go to homes, I've been to homes that were not good, where there was drug abuse, um, where there were lifestyles that I did not agree with, and I was not there to disrespect anyone. All right, do you understand love and respect go hand in hand? That uh, we, we've decided that we can be the judge and carry out a sentence on someone, and that's not respect. God didn't put you in that place. But in this time and place, it was more of a sharing in the act of the sacrifice, a participation, an awareness, and also an agreement. A um, friend told me the other day of some folks that invited he and the ministry, a pastor, over to their house, and... and um, they were drinking, and this pastor in particular um, had a very strong conviction about that. And again, friend, that's just not something that should separate the brethren. If you've got a strong conviction against it, I don't think you should despise. Now, if someone's drunk again, we've gone through that. That's a serious biblical issue. But in this case, the individuals who invited the pastor over were consuming alcohol and asked the, the pastor if he would like some, and, and he said, no, thank you. And they all kind of panicked and put it away and said, have we offended you? And he said, not at all. Said, no, you didn't offend me. This is your home. I just make a choice not to drink. Um, it, he didn't get into why. Um, but friend, when you go to someone's house, you're there as a guest. Um, and when they come to my home, they're in the Father's house too. See, here's the other thing. This is the Father's house. And my house is the Father's house. Let's keep going. Got to get back to this. Also, not only are we participating, you've got people in the church there participating in pagan worship and Satanism in some capacity, but also you've got people, and he just said, I've got a two-edged sword, and it's sharp. I have sharpened it for these specific purposes because I gave you a standard. And church, you, you, you say and you're holding on to my name and, and you're doing everything you can in a world of paganism, in a world of satanic spiritual warfare. But you've let some folks in that church that are still involved in pagan worship and they're involved in sexual immorality. Do I need to define that for anybody here? The, what that means? Again, I don't care. God cares. I, I really, to me, it's just a black and white thing. And it is here. He says, church, I love you. I love you. I've proven that. But I gave you the truth. And truth is a relative to emotion. Truth is truth. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Right? That's down and that is up. Right? I can be having a bad day and gravity still defines what is down. He says, I, I warned you. I gave you my standard. And you still... You're letting people do how they, like wild goats, like Nicolaitans, you're letting people do what they feel like they need or have justified doing. And I'm going to have to deal with it. Now, church discipline is long gone, and I am not recommending in any capacity we bring it back because the church has changed so much. There's a time when the church met, the church fellowship, the church function. We lived as neighbors, we lived as friends, we lived as family. That day no longer exists. Matter of fact, immediate families living in the same household struggle to know each other. We have abandoned love in the greatest capacity. And in so doing, we have foregone discipleship. Now listen. Everybody gets wound up about Sunday school. And please listen to me. And it is a valuable resource. But when the church forgot how to love, they forgot how to disciple. Now listen. 
they didn't have Sunday school classes, but people were still discipled. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just saying anyone who's passionate about discipling should not be as passionate about teaching a Sunday school or going to Sunday school class as much as they are about loving, mentoring, and investing in someone's life. Okay? Don't tell me you're passionate unless you can tell me people that are intentionally in your life that you are discipling. Now, I understand the value of Christian education, the purpose of Sunday school. I actually started to teach farm kids how to read and write because they weren't, didn't have the money or the means to go to school. Let's get back to it. So he's saying, I, I know you, you, really, you, you say good things and you really mean well, but in a, wor- in a world of compromise in Pergamos, you've compromised. I know you love me as a church. I know you've got faith in me, but you are allowing, you're not calling sin a sin. And so this sword, who is intended to cut those things away, to purify those things, and I gave you the standard and you're not keeping the standard, how do we keep the standard? This is kind of an ecclesiological issue which means the practices of the church we used to do that and then scripture tells us we're to go to our brothers and sisters in love in a generation that will not accept correction how do you communicate love we were i sorry to, to jeanette i'm telling you the school our school systems are, are absolutely the best i've ever been affiliated with in any shape, form, or fashion. And I'm so encouraged by the things I hear. But one of the things I'm hearing from some of our teachers, from my sister, who's in administration in another school, is that it's very difficult to correct them. You, you just can't because they're right. Because truth, whatever works for me, has become relative apart from the rules and regulations. Remember back when you just got spanked? How many of you got spanked? Right? I mean, they wore that hind end out. And they said, don't run in the hall. And when you run in the hall and you ran in the hall, what'd you get? You get a wearing out, didn't you? Now, you know what? Now, our schools here, they, they still do the spanking when you get permission. And I've been there when they're doing it. And they serious about it. Big Daddy don't want none of that thing. Y'all, y'all for real. And I'm proud of it. But holding a standard anymore has become nearly impossible. Why? Why did a culture lose standards? Because the church lost standards. How do you undo this thing? The second coming of Jesus Christ. You understand? When you go in this direction, there is no correction. There is no, and and I'm sorry, and I'm not being pessimistic, but the only correction is those eastern skies splitting open, him riding in and saying, come on, guys, it's time to get my people out of here because this world is literally going to hell in a handbasket when people who proclaim my name cannot even recognize my truth. You get it? He's saying there's a standard. We surrendered the standard. A lost world's predicament is natural. We are born into the hope of the world is who? Who's the hands and feet? Who's the preachers? The church. What happened? We did it. Sent. He came. We were sent as the hope of the world in Jesus Christ. And we abandon the citadel. We abandon the high point. We abandon the lampstand. We abandon the light post. That place, the citadel, the high point. The point that is most defensible, we surrendered. Love is not ignoring wrongdoing. Love is loving in spite of wrongdoing. 
Let's keep going. So sexual immorality, apparently that's a big deal to God. All right, if you'll take any time to read Scripture. Now, your definition and your justification of cultural evolution, of sexual evolution, of primary instinct, desire, is not your assessment. It's been given to you. Now, I love you, but there is no way in, in, on God's green earth you're going to change my conviction. You can call, I've been called ignorant because of my nearsightedness or my stubbornness. Um, I've been called a lot of things. Listen, I'm going to keep it simple for me. All right? If you wonder, if you ever wonder where I'm at and you want to come visit with me about something, I don't care what you think. I love you. I care what this says. All right? And so if you come to me with anything that's in opposition or anything that sounds funky to me, I'm going to look at you and say, I'm going to have to check on that. I mean, because folks come up with some crazy stuff. But if you ever come up with me a, sub, a subject that's just plain and white, black and white, I'm not going to agree with you. You know why? Because I wasn't given the freedom to agree with you. He made me. Everybody, how many of you think the God of the universe created you? He did. He made man and woman. And man and woman, they made man or woman, and then they begot so-and-so and begot so-and-so, and that's just how it happened. Matter of fact, I made a couple babies. I'm well aware how it happened. So for me to step back and tell the maker what he made, don't make no sense. He made me. And so the maker gets to decide what I am. And he gets to decide what I should believe. When my kids, I made them kids, and they in my house. I get to tell them the way it is right now. Now Aiden's growing up. Starting to think some things. And one day he's going to be on his own. But him being on his own does not change the rules that are still in my house. Friend, there's rules for the father's house. Man, I'm a guest. I'm a visitor. I'm a child. I just live here. I was put here. I was adopted into the father's house. And so I don't get input into the rules. And when I don't like the rules, what right do I have to go around and make new ones up? That doesn't, in what workplace does that work? In, in what place of education? In what, in what circumstance do the ones that are subordinate to the superiors get to dictate to the superiors exactly what they're going to do? All right. I was made by his hands, spoken of being by the voice, by the breath that is eternal. I belong to him. I've been purchased with a price. I'm an adopted son, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. I don't know how else to say this to such, and I include me, a rebellious people. I have no right other than that which has been given to me by his word. Well, I think my God wants to know what I think. Well, tell him. I don't need to hear. But when you tell him what you think, remember what he thinks. <laughs> All right? Now, and remember this. One day, there's going to be a sharp, two-edged sword not to harm you that's not what it exists for it exists for him to say son and daughter you've been living in my house and you've been carrying out the, the practices of Balaam and there, there's things in your life that should not be there there's practices that should not be there there's addictions that should not be there there's tendencies that should not be there and also the sexual immorality. That is, let me just define sexual immorality in the most common sense of words. 
any sexual desire, any sexual behavior, any visual that does not absolutely align with God's standards and decrees for sex. Any confusion on that? That's any. All right? Anything that involves that S word has got to be with God's standards related to that S word. Men, if you're looking at any picture, any movie, any flick, I don't, any calendar, that's not a picture of your wife, you know you got problems. Come on, boys. Right, you want to make a calendar with your wife? I just don't want it up in your refrigerator when I come to your house. You understand? All right. Can't get any clear. That would be weird. All right. In the, <laughs> people do weird things, folks. People do weird things. In the same way, you also hold the teaching the Nicolaitans. We talked about that. So he says, so I've got this two-edged sword, and what I'm going to do, I've got this thing, and it's not to harm you. It's to purify you in your process of sanctification. So when you got stuff, how many of you watched the, little, uh, the TV show Pimple Popper? If you have not watched that, watch it and eat peanut butter. That's the biggest challenge I've ever faced in my life. So we watch it a lot. It's, it's, it is addicting. This, this woman pulls out of the human body and the stuff people live with. People will show up with like a, a basketball thing. Like, oh, I've been there three years. God, last night was like I thought it was an ant bot. Friend, if you've got an ant bot the size of a basketball and it's been there three years, you need to go to the doctor. Everybody understand? Say amen. I don't want to see it, nor do I want to smell what comes out of that thing. You getting it? All right, so sometimes they go to her, and they've got big abscesses. And these abscesses are nasty. They're stinky. They're not supposed to be there. And the doctor says, how did you ignore that? That's obviously really sticking out in your life, right? People with stuff on their head, fingernails growing out of their scalp. If you've got a fingernail growing out of your scalp, everybody know you got a problem? Two hands. That's right. Two hands. That's a simple one. That's right. I got a problem. And they live with this, and then they go to her, and then what does she do? Inevitably, she cuts it off. She gets her scalpel. And if you have a big cyst thing or um, lymph lympho- lymphedema is what she calls it. I've heard that word a thousand times in the last three weeks. She'll cut it, and then she will squeeze Squeeze, that's a new word. It's squeeze and ooze at the same time. And that's exactly what happened is she squeezes it. <laughs> and she does, and she gets a pan, and she cuts it, and she squeezes it. And folks, the stuff that comes out of there, you've got to watch it. Why? For education. Because if something ever comes out of me like that, I'm going to do it myself. Second. Because this is much worse than anything I've seen on that show. Everybody in the room's like, oh, man, whoa. Everybody's wearing shields because it just splatters everywhere. Friend, we all go to the doctor. And he's saying, you got something on you that should not be there. You know it shouldn't be there. And I've got a sharp two-edged sword now. I'm going to have to get rid of that. You're going to have to sit still for a minute. And when I get rid of it, sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it costs you something. Sometimes, all the time actually, it's going to require a life change to keep this from coming back. That sharp two-edged sword was never to harm you. It wasn't to hurt your feelings. It wasn't to offend you. And let's be honest, why are you offended? Because you feel a different way. Well, why did you feel? How do you feel a different way? Because at some point, you bought into paganism. Sure, you can be a Christian. And lies creep in and take you hostage. I'm not being mean. There is a sharp two-edged sword, and it is there to cut and remove whatever harms us. Friend, and what's funny, and I hate to keep bringing up, watch the show. Well, actually, if you want to, I don't want to. It always starts off small, they said. It's just a little bump. And what, what amazes me, well, i got to let you go. I'm, well, y'all getting your money's worth the past two weeks. Is it gets enormous... 
and they just cover it up. This one woman had this thing in her head and literally a, like a, a dragon claw coming out. And she would just put her hair up in a bun. Now listen, it didn't matter how you walked by this woman. Everybody said you could smell it. It just stunk. Mom stinks. The little horn, she said when she would hit it, it would hurt. And you could see the horn coming out of the hair. Everybody knows that you keep trying to hide it. He says, you're in my house, but this I got against you. I love you, son, and I love you, daughter, and you know that. You know I love you. But there's some stuff in your life that these eyes have seen that my heart, his heart, knows. And I'm going to need you to repent. Never does he say, I love you and sin is okay. He defines the sin very clearly. And he says, now repent or I'm coming quickly. Why? I just told you what the truth is. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Now listen, I do not believe God will let his children continue in unrepentant sin. I told you. I lined it out for you. Now you repent. I'm going to let you go and you try. But if you, now, the trying's in his power and grace and his mercy and his tenderness, and this is our new every morning. But the heart of repentance is an effort to be more like Jesus Christ. I gave you the standard. I gave you the truth. I'm going to give you a chance. Or I'm going to have to deal with it. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I thank you for the opportunity we have again to come. And Lord, we've just got to get to that point of our, of our life where you're God or Honestly, has there been a salvific experience? How can our eternity be trusted, the one who is not God? How can the, our life circumstances be entrusted to someone who is not sovereign? We live in the Father's house, but we live by our rule. There is no shame here. And we, we've thought and heard these things for so long. There is no shame in coming broken. But there is certainly a conviction when we leave having denied healing. And it is in the name of the one who carries, who yields, who wields the sharp two-edged sword. That name of Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. And I'm going to ask you.